I'm Michael Fox, and this is the Prospector News Podcast. And I am uh, joined today by Guy Goulet, who is the uh, president and CEO of Sarah de Pasco Minerals. Uh, welcome, Guy. Hi, Michael. Uh, it's good to have you on the show. Uh, as my listeners know, uh, I'm a big believer in uh, finding good jockeys who are su serially successful. And um, you first, although we've only known each other in the last few years, uh, our uh, mutual friend Chen Lin, who uh, introduced us at BDAC uh, two or three years ago, um, I was aware of you through uh, your previous venture at uh, Maya Gold and Silver, which became Aya Gold and Silver, um, uh, a very successful gold and silver mine in the uh, Kingdom of Morocco in Northern Africa. Um, but I was aware of your, you know, your success stories prior to that. Uh, so let's talk about Sarah DePasco, your newest project, and uh, uh, let's talk, tell people what it is. So Michael's uh, Sarah DePasco, it's a city in the Andes of Peru. It's 4,400 meters above sea level. It's a, it's a community of 67,000 people. The Spanish came up there in the 1630. They found that big mass of lead, zinc, copper, gold, and silver, and they start mining. They mine, they mine forever. That mine has never stopped its operation since. It's almost 400 years now. It's uh, well, I, I don't know one mine in the world that has such a statistic. Back in 1906, Mr. J.P. Morgan himself made a decent investment in Cerro Pasco. This became the largest gold, copper, silver mine in the world. They list the company in 1916 on the New York Stock Exchange. It was called Cerro de Pasco Copper Corporation. That was the, the school of all the mines. Like the Americans have sent the best engineers, the best geologists, the best equipment. Cerro de Pasco became the cash cow of the country. They extracted 300 million tons out of that mine over those 400 years. Some of it was processed, 75 million tons, and the rest was a stockpile. Some of it was in the, in the sulfide forms. Some of it was in the oxide form. But overall, there's 200 million tons of stockpile. So what we own, Cerro de Pasco Resource, we own the irrevocable mineral rights on the stockpile and the tailings. In fact, we, we, we own irrevocable mineral rights on 200 million tons of material, which is sitting above ground. So um, in uh, 2019, we wanted to buy the former mine that belongs to uh, Vulcan, which was uh, mainly owned by Glencore at the time. So uh, we we were going into a, a, a transaction where we were to buy the two flotation facilities, which used to process 13,000 tons per day. And uh, we were also buying the oxide plant and we were buying what was left in the pit. And uh, we ended up doing a four months uh, due diligence uh, with uh, two of our engineers and two of our geologists. And uh, we knew precisely from the monthly report that we we review from 1906 when Mr. J.P. Morgan made the investment until 1992 when they stopped sending material into the, the tailing. So we know precisely the, uh, the ed grades we know precisely what was recovered, so we know precisely what is left in that tailing. So we end up with a resource of 460 million ounce of silver equivalent just in the tailing. Today's price, it's, a, it's $15 billion worth of metals above ground. And let's recall that producing a base metal or a precious metal, 40% of the cost is mining. There's no mining there. It's all sitting uh, on the ground. That, that's perfect. And what does the meteorology tell you about uh, how much you can take out of the uh, out of the tailings that are above ground? 
So, so we figure out that they, they have recovered uh, 60% of the metals. Why uh, so low recovery? Uh, at the time, well, 1906, the technologies and the regions were not, not so performant as they are today. Uh, we read that the grinding was not appropriate, but what we 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 uh, we note notice the most is that they were doing some flotation, but on only doing flotation on 24 hours period. Generally, when you do flotation, you go 48 to 72 hours. Why they were doing uh, not longer? Just because every day. They were extracting from that pit 20,000 tons of material, and they were processing 13,000 tons. So there were 7,000 tons stockpiled mixed with waste. So the next day, there was a new 20,000 ton that has been extracted over the past 24 hours. So they were taking that fresh material throwing everything that was in the flotation cells away and putting a new batch. So the recovery was no good. So to answer your question, we think conservative, we're going to recover 42% of the metals that are still in, 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 in that tailing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good opportunity to have. So it sounds to me like the, the old guys back in the 1900s were actually mining faster than they could process them, the ore. And as a result, they were leaving a lot of opportunity in these tailings ponds. Exactly. Well, all the people that operate that mine, uh, first of all, was, uh, well, it was nationalized in 1971 by Centro Min, which is a division of the government. And uh, back in 1999, the prices of the, the metals collapsed so uh, Centro Mid were looking for a, a buyer. They need like a, a major company, a Canadian or an American or a Chinese or an Australian. But they, they, they succeed selling the mine to Volcan, which was a, a Peruvian entity, one of the largest zinc producer in the world. So both Centro Min and Volcan were mining were operating that mine very aggressively. Dynamite 24 hour a day, trucking 24 hour a day, processing 24 hour a day, dust, noise. So, uh, so we're going to come with a, a different approach. How so? Or just we're going to probably uh, come with pumps and uh, we're going to create a mud in that tailing and we're just going to pump the mud to those two existing facilities, which are 1.2 kilometers away from the, the tailings. So that means no noise, no trucking, no dynamite, no dust. The people of Cerro de Pasco just want this project to move forward. Like, let's recall that mine used to employ 7,000 people. Today, that mine barely employs 500 people. There's 67,000 people living there. What else do you want to do at Cerro Pasco beside mining? I repeat, it's 4,400 meters above sea level. There's nothing to do else than mining. We were talking with the mayor of the community lately. The mayor's, uh, they call him the presidente of the community. And he was pointing out our tailing and our stockpile. And he told us, he says, uh, we all want our kids to go back to school, to go to college and university in Lima. We just don't have the money anymore. And he point out our stockpile and our tailings. And he says, uh, this is what's going to bring our kids back to school. That's that's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a community story I hear all over the world that People want opportunities for their kids, and they see mining as the uh, as one of those opportunities for them to have their kids have better lives. Uh, you, you look what we're going to do there, Michael, and uh, that's why I came in by the wind to that project. Uh, I'm 62, and uh, 
I couldn't stop there when Steven Zadka, the uh, architect of that project, present me that project, present me the Cerro Tasco stockpile. So, so we're going to create, check the seven winning condition here. Number one, we're going to create the wealth back in the community of Cerro de Pasco, number one. Number two, let's recall that stockpile and that tailing produce a lot of acid water. We didn't do that mess, but we're going to correct that mess. So we're going to take care of the acid water. It's in the heavy cost for the government. This is winning condition number two. In 20 years, there's no more acid water. We have cleaned up the old stockpile and tailings, and we're probably going to throw everything back in, in the pit there. This is number three. Number four, we're going to pay to the government, government of Peru, Minister of Economy and Finance, some $25 million US worth of income tax from our $120 million uh, cash flow we're going to uh, to earn every year. This is number number four. Number five, we might be able to produce sulfuric acid with that pyrite. Uh, and number six, with that sulfuric acid, we might even do the electrolysis and produce green hydrogen. And number seven, it's going to be huge benefit from our shareholders. Sounds like a, a seven and zero oh waiting right across the board. Um, yeah. As we we kind of alluded to with the old timers not having patience and they were pro, you know mining faster than they could process. Um, patience really is a virtue, and uh, and that, and working in that part of the world, you have to be very patient with government uh, as you as they move very slowly. Uh, but finally, patience has paid off for you guys. Uh, Tell us about the permitting you've just been awarded. Yeah. So, Michael, you check our uh, market cap. We had a market cap of uh, $150 million uh, a few years ago. We lost our market cap. Our market cap presently $60 million. Why is that? It took us too much time to get access right. Okay. So I have to explain why. I told you in 1971, Santro Min, which was a division of the government of Peru, nationalized the mine. In 1999, they sold it to Volcan. But at the time, Volcan didn't want to buy the stockpile and the tailings. Why is that? 1999, nobody were thinking about reprocessing tailings. Why? Price of metals were too low. I remember I had a gold mine in Val d'Or, Quebec. We had to shut down the mine since the price of gold went down to $262 US per ounce. So nobody were thinking about reprocessing tailing, but that stockpile and that tailing is active. It produced acid water. The government just could not run away. So they had to create another entity and trusted to take care of historic liabilities, and they create Activos Mineros, and they gave the mandate to Activos Mineros either to close the tailings or to take care of it, okay? But nobody could have access to it. So they create that perimeter, and uh, they got the budget every year, and they do some work there to make sure that there's no acid water going. But when you look at all those conditions, those winning conditions I gave to you, the only solution, in fact, is take all that material and throw it back into the pit. But, but Activos min Mineros had the mandate to close it. And in Peru, it's not easy. It's, it's formal. When you get a permit, it's a very, very solid permit. It's a strong permit. That's why those major companies are all in, Chinalco, Newmont, Tech, Barrick, all the big names are in Peru. Why? When you get a permit, it's a solid permit. As long as you pay your income tax, you're there, there's no problem. But to get your permit, sometimes you got to go to, uh, through a, a long process. So what we had to do, starting two years ago, we had to go into that procedure. 
where on one side you've got Activos Mineros mandated to close the area of the tailings, but on the other hand, we've got the irrevocable right mineral rights on those tailings. So there's two things in the same law that oppose. So we have to go into a long process where we get the opinion from Minister of Energy and Mine, where we get an opinion from the Minister of Economy and Finance, where we get an opinion from the Minister of Housing, and we when we get an opinion from the Minister of Agriculture. So we put all those favorable opinions together. And two weeks ago, the, the president of the country signed a force easement to enable us to access the ground and perform 40 holes to transform that resource. I just mentioned to you, 460 million ounce of silver equivalent into a 43-101 resource. So uh, this, this was announced two weeks ago, and uh, uh, you'll probably see us with some drill on site, I would say, in uh, two weeks from now. So as, as bad as we were not giving news to the market because we didn't have any permit, now, from now and on, so we're going to announce at some point the geophysics has is, is been complete. Then we're going to announce we're starting the first of the 40 holes. Then we're going to announce drill results. Then we're going to announce uh, PEA in uh, end of Q3 or Q4 this year. And that PEA from our model should end up with an NPV from our model at 1.35 billion US. Michael, we're trading at 60 million Canadian market cap. There will be an adjustment at some point. Yeah, it's like there's been an imaginary starter's pistol fired off in the in the Andes, and it's not a marathon; it's a sprint now. Exact, exact. But what we've been what we've been checking since last night, it's the amount of tellurium we've got in that tailing. Like it was not report. Like people were mining gold, silver. They were selling, in fact, concentrate of lead, zinc, and copper. But nobody thought about looking at tellurium or cadmium or silurium or indium. So if you got if you check the flow sheet of the the mill La Horoya, which was the big refinery south of Cerro de Pasco, you see all those critical metals that were contained in, in that uh, tailing. So uh, so we have started like last night talking about that, and we spent part of the evening talking about that. It's going to be a big cherry on the cake. Those critical metals, if we get them for, uh, like we don't have to look for them, they are in the tailings. Yeah, it's like bonus cash flow. And uh, for our listeners who aren't familiar with Tellarium, uh, is the uh, outside of silver, it's the uh, second uh, most used uh, mineral inside of solar panels that you, you know, see for the solar energy industry so uh it is a critical metal and uh if Guy has it on his uh in his tailings ponds this is going to be a huge win for the company so even my goal not to challenge you but i think it's more used than silver a lot more used than silver it's the number one metal used in the for solar panel Okay, I'll I'll take your word on that. I am not a I'm not an engineer. I know it was uh, I, I, uh, everybody sure talked Michael. about silver and tellurium every time they I have a conversation about solar panels. This is all exciting. Um, there's going to be plenty of news coming here for the rest of the year. What's the timeline before you start processing some of these tailings again? So well, we'll go. Uh, well, it's a big it's a big time. It's like it's a uh, it's seventy five million tons. So uh, we got to do a full feasibility study. Uh, we probably have to replace and make a deal to uh, to be able to process uh, our material in those existing flotation facilities. Uh, so we think probably uh, beginning of 2026. That's still a pretty short timeline compared to a lot of operations out there. Well, it, it takes 10 years to make a mine. So we're talking here a year and a half. Exciting times for the company, for sure. If they wish yeah. to uh, 
continue to follow the company and as this story rolls out, how is the best to do so, Guy? Yeah, people should go to our website or they can register to our mass mailing list because there will be a lot of press release coming out. Wonderful. I'll post the website to the bottom of the description of this uh, podcast and I encourage everybody to do so. Um, Guy, thank you very much for bringing me up to date. This is exciting news for the company after uh, a number of years of patiently waiting. So I look forward to see how this rolls out for the rest of the year. Thank you for the invitation, Michael. Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Bye. Sarah DePasco Resources is a paid sponsor of the Prospector News. The host owns shares and warrants bought at the market for investment purposes. The Prospector News podcast is for educational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and are not to be taken as investment advice. Listeners need to do their own due diligence and seek advice of a licensed investment advisor.